Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. The atmosphere has been studied for millennia. Some of the earliest examples of writing contain references to the weather, and predicting and understanding the weather was a key part of many ancient religions, particularly in ancient Babylonia, for example. But the study of the atmosphere was always limited by the fact that we humans are trapped on the surface of the Earth. And its atmosphere goes a fair bit higher. So when flight was made possible, first by balloons, it was an exciting time for the study of the atmosphere. The first successful human flight took place in 1783 in France via hot air balloon. That was quite quickly followed by another flight in a balloon that was lifted via lighter than air gas, like for example hydrogen. And the brave people who took part in these early experiments and started exploring the skies via balloons became known as aeronauts, quite literally air sailors. And one particular example of an aeronaut was Henry Coxwell. Coxwell was an incredibly skilled balloonist with dozens of successful flights under his belt, some of which nearly killed him, by the time that he was asked to construct a huge new balloon called the Mammoth. He was asked to do this by a fascinating man called James Glacier. Glacier was the head of the Department of Meteorology at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, London. But before that, before being trapped behind a desk, Glacier worked out in the field. He collected observations for the British Trigonometric Survey. And he recognised that science was limited by the data available. So he tasked Coxwell with building the Mammoth and training up some meteorologists to take observations of the atmosphere above the surface of the Earth. But one day, one of the meteorologists declined to ascend, and so Glacier seized on the opportunity to get out from behind his desk and get out taking observations again in the field. Well, the sky. Now, the atmosphere gets thinner and colder the higher you get, and this has been known for a long time. It was presumed that this meant the atmosphere simply got colder and colder until there's no air anymore and you reach outer space. But it turns out that isn't true. While the air density decreases uniformly with altitude until you reach space, temperature does not. As Coxwell and Glacier ascended in the Mammoth on the 5th of September 1862, it eventually became clear that something was very wrong. The balloon's rate of ascent was controlled by the quantity of lighter than air gas, and they used coal gas, contained within the balloon. So you could slow your rate of ascent by venting some of that gas via a release line. But as the balloon had ascended, it had twisted and the release line for venting the gas had become twisted up in the rigging, such that they couldn't use it. The pair had no control over their rate of ascent, and they were going up faster and faster and faster, higher than anyone had in human history. So in this desperate situation, Coxwell was forced eight kilometers above the Earth's surface to climb out of the basket and up into the rigging to try and free the line. But at this point, the air around the aeronauts is so thin that there's just not enough oxygen in it. So Glacier falls unconscious. Right up until this point, he's been taking measurements, but slumps against the basket. And Coxwell is barely hanging in there. And I mean that literally, because at this altitude, it's so cold that he loses all sensation in his hands and they actually start to turn black with frostbite. So he's just barely hanging on in the rigging. And eventually, he manages to grab hold of the release line and he jumps back down into the basket, but finds that his hands are so cold that he can't pull on the line. He's only able to save his life and Glacier's life by taking the rope and putting it in his teeth and then yanking as hard as he can with his neck until he hears some gas venting above. And at this point, like seconds from cheating death, there's this amazingly Victorian exchange between the pair. And Coxwell goes over to Glacier and he wakes him up. Coxwell says to Glacier, do try to take temperature and barometer observations, do try. Glacier replies, I have been insensible. To which Coxwell says, you have, and I too, very nearly. Glacier did start taking measurements again, but by the time he did, the balloon was already descending, and so data is missing from the very zenith of their flight. So we can only estimate how high they actually went, but likely that maximum altitude achieved was between 9.5 kilometers and 11 kilometers above the surface, which is unbelievably still an altitude record for flight without assistance by breathing apparatus. Had Glacier remained sensible, to use his own word, then he would have made 
a shocking discovery. Because if he'd been looking at his instruments at that altitude, as they ascended while the air pressure would have continued to fall, the air temperature would have stayed exactly the same. In fact, eventually it would have increased as they continued to ascend. That's because they'd entered the stratosphere. This is the second layer of the Earth's atmosphere, with very different dynamics to the layer that we live in below, called the troposphere. It's almost certain that Coxwell and Glacier were the first humans to enter this alien, ghostly section of the Earth's atmosphere, but were simply unprepared for the conditions they found there. So they made the briefest of forays and then just slipped back down through the clouds, unaware of the threshold they had crossed. If Glacier had stayed conscious, he would have made a paradigm-shifting discovery about the Earth's atmosphere, that it was formed of distinct layers. But this instead fell to the astoundingly named pair of Léon-Philippe Tesserang de Boer and Richard Aßmann half a century later. If you'd like to learn more about that and the surrounding history, you should probably pre-order my upcoming book, Firmament, link in the description on the development of atmospheric science. Scientific progress in all fields is limited by technological factors. We couldn't take observations of the atmosphere until the thermometer and the barometer were invented. We couldn't take observations above the surface until balloons were invented. And without the invention of breathing apparatus, we could barely scratch the stratosphere. Improvements in balloon technology and eventually liquid fuel rock Rockets enabled us to map the entire atmosphere. But at the end of the day, it required humans to use that technology, to use it in an intelligent way, and in some cases, in a very brave way, in order to make scientific progress. Science sits at the confluence of technological and sociological factors. Glacier was the person who commissioned Coxwell to build the mammoth, to build the balloon. And he did so as part of this broader movement in the 19th century of moving science away from the work of the individual towards the work of large institutions, such as, for example, the Greenwich Observatory. But even within that large framework, Glacier and Coxwell stand out, I think, for their brave, frankly miraculous, first return trip to the stratosphere. Science has come a long way since the 1860s, and you can learn about some of our amazing discoveries with Brilliant. Brilliant is an educational website and app built around the principle of learning by doing. Instead of asking you to memorize a load of new information and then regurgitate it on a test, Brilliant is about learning topics in maths, science, and computer science by introducing you to a new concept and then immediately asking you to apply it. And if you get that application right, then great. If you don't, then you learn from the experience with no harm done. Having worked with Brilliant for a long time, by this point I've tried out several of their expertly written courses in chemistry and programming and physics and calculus, but I've got degrees in these areas so I'm probably not the ideal test subject. So I asked my fiance Pixel Girl, who's a languages teacher with no scientific training, to try Brilliant. Yeah, I gave Brilliant a go and I felt that it was really good in making topics that I'd never covered before understandable, like programming. I've always wanted to give it a go, but I never knew where to start. It made it really fun and just, it was like, I really enjoyed the fact that it was bite-sized chunks of learning and you felt that even in five minutes you could learn something new. Brilliant is an ideal companion to classroom learning if you're in formal education, or a fun way to be introduced to new topics in STEM if, like Pixel Girl, you're a little older. Plus, a subscription makes for an ideal present for any ambitious learners in your life. So to get Brilliant for yourself, or perhaps support a young family member through school, Christmas is coming up, head to brilliant.org slash Simon Clark. And the first 200 viewers to do so will get a sweet 20% discount on an annual subscription and support this channel. That's brilliant.org slash Simon Clark. With thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. The amazing art in this video was made by the amazing Lizzie Fierkowski. Do check her out on Instagram, link below, and check out our previous collaborations. We've made videos on how the atmosphere changes as you get higher and higher, and on the feasibility of the planet seen in Star Trek. You can even buy a poster of Lizzie's art in the former. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that you liked it. If you did, please do pop it a like on YouTube. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, then here's some recommended viewing next. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.